I've been a super emotional person most of my life, but I hated expressing my emotions. I felt like it made me weak. And then I met Jay, who taught me that I should express my emotions if it felt right to me. But we had huge arguments over my repression versus my expression. So today we're going to talk to Jay about emotions. Jay, why the F do I have to have emotions? I'm glad you asked, Cynthia, because you teed it up for like an infomercial, <laughs> probably editing all that in. No, was. leave it in. It's funny. <laughs> okay. It's funny. Okay, fine. Yeah. It's emotional and funny. <laughs> all right. Seriously, though, for something that's so important to every human on the planet, you think more people would be asking why do we have emotions? What are these for? Something like that. Right. And basically, they're your compass. It's a compass. Yeah. Your emotions are your compass. They're there to guide you through life and help you thrive if you use them properly and wisely. Yeah. So if I'm crying hysterically over a commercial I saw on TV, this is a compass? I mean, technically, yeah. Okay. Every emotion is is part of your emotional compass. All right. Can you expand on that and explain a little? Well, think about it. Ever since you were a child, your emotions were guiding you. If someone took your toy, it didn't feel good, and you immediately pursued some kind of solution. Now, there are lots of different solutions you could pursue, but your emotions are always the guide. Like, they're rock solid. They're telling you something is not great about this situation, and you would like a change. Okay. Now, you can go and try and beat Johnny up for taking your toy and take it back. That's one solution. But then you might feel even worse. You might get punished. You might feel angry. You might hurt your hand. And so your emotions will be guiding you again. Like, first, your emotions were trying to guide you that you need to change something about this situation, this lost toy situation. Then you go and beat up Johnny and your emotions guide you again and say, hey, When I said do something about this situation, I didn't mean randomly go beat up Johnny. And now you're going to feel bad about that. But if you went and told your mom or your aunt or something about the stolen toy, maybe things go smoother. You feel like, okay, I did the right thing. This is good. You get your toy back. Your parents help you and Johnny make amends. Something like this. Okay, yeah. And now you feel good. And your your emotions have guided you again. Mm -hmm. First, they guided you that something needs to be done or changed or action needs to be taken or you need to adjust your approach to this whole thing. Right. And then they guided you whether or not a certain solution was acceptable, was the right one for you. Okay. In another case, perhaps you don't beat up Johnny and you don't tell your mom, you just sit there and cry. You have a good cry. And then you feel better and you move on and you pick up another toy and that's the end of it. You never worry about it again. That's another way. If your emotions are calm and you feel good about it, fine. But if the crying is not a good enough solution, then that emotion is going to stay with you and and be unresolved in your body. And it's going to become like emotional trauma or somatic trauma in your body or something right okay and then you'll end up dealing with it in therapy and when the emotion finally comes out and you move through it then ah i feel much better about that stolen toy thing from my childhood but you see what i'm saying in every single case your emotions are the guide they are the guide they are the compass they are pointing the way they are calling your attention to something that needs to be dealt with okay personally, by you. Right. Something needs to be handled Mm -hmm. internally, externally, both. I don't know. But your emotions are the compass. This could apply to anything. Name a situation, name an emotion that ever happened, and I'll show you. It's your compass. Okay. So for example, um, getting super anxious for no reason in the middle of the day. Yeah. I mean, I don't do this anymore, but I used to. And I know lots of people still suffer and deal with this. So this is an emotion. Yeah. But no one feels emotions for no reason. Right. It doesn't happen. You don't feel emotions for no reason. There's something at the root of it. Right. Okay. It could be you're picking up someone's energy nearby. You could have had something from the past triggered by an environmental thing. Mm Mm-hmm. There could be something you've been putting off or repressing for a long time. There could be you just haven't been fulfilling your life purpose. You've been living your days on autopilot and your emotional compass is drawing your attention to, hey, what are you doing with your days? Right. It could be anything, but it is something. Okay. And if you start journaling or thinking or tuning into your feelings and your body and your emotions, you'll find out. You'll find what's up. That's why you have them. Maybe you're just carrying too much tension in your neck or jaw and and your emotion is letting you know, hey, you've been breathing shallowly for a long time. A lot of people breathe shallowly and they don't 
even realize it. Right. But your, their emotions know. Their yeah. emotions can tell them. Their emotions can point out when you've been breathing shallowly. It's like, I feel anxious right now. Yeah. Did you check your breathing for the last 45 minutes? Yeah. No wonder you feel anxious right now. But it only works if you pay attention to the compass. That's that's really good. Thank you. Uh, so I, I've noticed uh, in the past when I had feelings of like where I felt okay, and then all of a sudden I felt worse, it's because I started having thoughts about things in the past that had already happened. Yeah. And your but emotions are saying, yo, what's up with these thoughts? Maybe you should change your thoughts. Maybe today was not the day to go thinking about all this past stuff. Yeah. Maybe you should be thinking about building a great future. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should be thinking about getting water and getting food and going for a walk. Why are your thoughts on this? Please control your mind and use some different thoughts. Your emotions are your compass. They're trying to point stuff out to you. Uh, okay, this, this is good. Thank you. All right. So I have an issue with expressing emotions in public. Mm -hmm. I have like, it's seriously, if I cry in public, it, I may like dry my tears and look okay on the outside, but I am like, I don't want to say beating myself up over it anymore. Not, not anymore, but can't, can we just repress emotions so we don't have to deal with them? Or can we just like not deal with them? I mean, is, is there a way to just push them away and not be unhealthy? I'm laughing because I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm really genuinely curious. Well, let me ask you, do you think throughout the history of humanity that people have tried to repress their emotions and not deal with them? <sighs> yeah. Once or twice? Or all the time. An incredible number of times. <laughs> I, just me alone. I've done a huge amount of Sure. Times. And how about your daughter? Uh, yeah. And your mom? Of course. And your girlfriends? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Coworkers at jobs? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So people have tried this. Yeah, but okay. maybe we're doing it wrong. Well, maybe it's possible. So people, many people have tried this. And what has been the result every time? Let me, let me rephrase it. Let me ask a different way. There are 8 billion people on the planet. If mm -hmm. I gave you unlimited time, money, and resources, do you think you could find someone who repressed their emotions to a, a great, thriving, effective result? Probably not. Probably not. I wouldn't want to take that bet. No. Okay. I'm like disappointed. <laughs> I am. I don't think you should be. Okay. Because... What's the point of a compass? When you go camping, do you take a compass? Oh, yeah, you need a compass. Oh, oh, you seem so <laughs> so excited about it, so thrilled, so 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 focused on having this compass. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why would you not want the emotional compass if this thing is such a helpful thing? Well, an emotional it's, it's a deal breaker. If you. I go camping without a compass, I'm going to get lost in the woods. Yeah, you're going to have a miserable experience. Yeah. They're, they're, you're going to blare witch it up. Okay, I got you. If you have a needle on a gauge or a meter, mm -hmm. that needle is there to help you. Someone took time and effort to create it. Right. Not for no reason. They created this needle and gauge for the user. Yeah. And they did it to benefit the world. Like they did it to help people. And so I don't know who, what you believe about the creator or whatever, but whoever or whatever made you end up with emotions was trying to help you. If you have a gas gauge with a needle and the, the needle can go to F for full or E for empty, mm -hmm. do you want to repress this, put black mm -hmm. tape over it? I don't want to deal with this. Or is that very good to know? <laughs> even if it's on empty, it's still helpful to you. Yeah. Even if it's showing you the most negative sign a car can have, like out of gas, still good to know. Sure. Right. And your emotions, even if they're negative, are still showing you something really important. I got you. So not only can people not repress them, I mean, to any reasonable, helpful, effective result, mm -hmm. people ideally should be celebrating them, like celebrating that they have them, even if it's super deep depression. Yes, I get it. It's terrible bad. But when your tank is on empty, it's good to know. All right. So it's totally fair. I get what you're saying. Okay. So there's no... Uh, positives that really are going to come out of repressing my emotions. And and you're right. I've never experienced this as a positive thing, but I thought maybe there might be a way that we could do this in a healthy way, but I get what you're saying. Can you way. healthily ignore the compass or the gas gauge? No, no you can't. Yeah. I mean, you can, but then you're going to end up stranded. Uh, whether it's the gas gauge, you're going to run out of gas and you're going to be yeah. away from a gas station. It won't be a positive you're, result. Yeah, no, it won't. It won't. So, okay. Makes sense. Thank you.
then I'm going to move on. So as a woman, I've been super emotional most of my life. Like, like I said in the intro, we've had issues over this too, about me being such a crybaby and just uh, unnecessarily emotional. And I've had lots of men in my life in relationships and just family and friends and whatever. And I noticed that men seem to have more control over their emotions. I mean, not all men. I know this is true. But in general, most men seem to have control over their emotions. So why? Why do most men seem to have control over their emotions more than women. Why is the average bowler in a bowling league better at bowling than some random off the street? Because they have practice and Ah, experience. Practice and experience. So do you know any women who've had a lot of practice and experience at controlling their emotions? Not really. Right. But do you know any guys (laughs) who've had practice and experience controlling their emotions? Yeah. Most men that I know are have practiced at this because they're told not to be a P word and, and to like push it down. So they don't really have practice expressing those emotions. Sure. That's, that's practice repressing emotions, right. but you were asking about controlling them. Right. So maybe it's. Oh, repression and control are very different. Okay. So this is where uh, I'm confused then. So I thought they would kind of be on, on the same. No, because if you take a bunch of guys and have them all repress their emotions, they just become traumatized, broken men, like bottling things up till they explode and they need tons of therapy. So this wasn't very great control of emotions. Whereas you take Buddha or the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or somebody and they they literally control their emotions. Stress and chaos is going on around them. They are yeah, very yeah. zen. These are zen masters. Okay, so I I get it. I guess I should have defined what I'm what I meant by control. All right, I, I understand with your examples the difference. I think maybe I've seen repression as control with the examples you just gave, and so I'm kind of I I know a lot of men who I thought were actually in control. And by what you just said, have actually been repressing their emotions. Okay. It's pretty common. But you will find Zen masters. Yes. Who are really good at controlling their emotions. Yeah, of course. Or even just just certain celebrities that you look up to. It's like, they don't repress. They're actually good at controlling their emotions through the ups and downs of entrepreneurship and life and so on. On the other hand, some of them do repress. (laughs) And they end up, like I said, needing tons of therapy or having health issues or... Okay, so is there a way to tell this on the outside without going deep into the like toxic stuff? Is there a way to see the difference between someone repressing and someone controlling? Like I said earlier, if you repress your emotions, you're not going to get a positive result. You can't ignore the gas gauge. You can't ignore the emotional compass and get a positive result. Sooner or later, it's going to blow up in your face somehow. So you can see if you pay attention over time, maybe, but it doesn't really matter. What what matters is all of us, each of us individually know whether we're repressing an emotion or controlling an emotion or dealing with it or facing it or expressing it. We all know what we're doing with that emotion in the moment. You might do it on autopilot. You might be so so trained and so practiced now that you don't even think about it, but just like breathing, even if it's autopilot, you can always tune into it and be conscious of it at any time see now i'm consciously breathing right but while we were talking i was doing it on autopilot right so if i go and have an emotion i might on autopilot repress it or bury it or dismiss it or avoid it Mm -hmm. but i could also consciously tune into it anytime i want okay you can start journaling anytime you want and have those emotions come up I feel tense in my jaw. Why do I feel tense in my jaw? I haven't felt fulfilled in my career lately. I feel lost. Whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can just start writing out your feelings. If you're ecstatic, I feel great. There's no tension in my body anywhere. I feel like I'm walking on air. This is the greatest day that's ever existed. If you're writing that, then maybe you don't have any emotions to work through. Right. Or maybe you're too happy. I don't know. Okay, I got you. Well, the other night we were at a, a dinner party. And someone said something that kind of made me mad. And I, (laughs) at the time, I thought I was in control of the emotion that I felt, of of the anger. Maybe you were repressing it. I I was. And then a little while later, when they apologized to me, I realized that I had repressed it. And then... And then in that moment when they apologized, I took control. I was still, I was still angry. So that 
at that time when they apologized, we hadn't spoken in the, I don't know, 20 minutes that had gone by. And I kind of pushed it, pushed it down and, and had a conversation with someone else. And then when I went back to him and, and had the conversation, I could feel my anger immediately come up, even when he we brought it up. He didn't like start with the apology right away. Like he brought it up again. And I felt that emotion rise up. And in that moment, I realized he was apologizing, but that's not why I controlled it. I controlled it because I had I had time to focus my mind on something else. The other conversation I had with with a woman. And and then when I came back to it, I felt in control to discuss it again. And I was like, it's fine. It's no big deal. And I really meant it. I wasn't like, in that moment, I wasn't repressing it. So, but if you had asked me before this conversation, I would have said, oh, I was in control the whole of time. the whole the whole time, but I was not. So this is good. Yeah, this is good. common. Yeah. You okay. unconsciously or, or on autopilot repress your emotion at the beginning because mm -hmm. you don't want to deal with it then and there. It doesn't feel safe. It's not the right environment. You're not practiced at it for whatever reason. Yeah. You repress it on autopilot. And some people will repress it for years. Right. But you repressed it for 20 minutes. Right. And then when someone else brought up the topic again, you had a moment to, okay, now I can deal with this emotion and look at the compass and look at the gauge. And what is it telling me? What is it telling me about this situation? It's telling you to let your anger go and accept this apology and yeah. get on with life and be friends with everybody. That's yeah. what your emotion was telling you. Yeah, and and had I been repressing it, if we were talking about it now, uh, that anger would have come up. Yeah, and then this wow. is why you get people bursting out at random things on random moments, yeah. and no one knows why. But it's like I can tell you why. Oh, this is why they get triggered. Yeah. If you're, <laughs> yeah, I love this. Look okay. at the Dalai Lama or Buddha or whoever, and they're like never triggered because they don't repress any emotions. They express emotions. They deal with emotions. They meditate on emotions. They work through emotions. They journal emotions. They dance the emotions away, whatever it is. So people who are getting triggered is because they repress the emotion and then it comes back up to the surface and they, pff, they crap on everybody or whoever they're talking to or whatever they're dealing with because they've repressed it. And yeah, because control. the needle always points north. Like it's always okay. you can't change the needle. You're like, oh, I'll just shove the needle different way. It's like okay, right. but yeah. when you're when you let go and you're, you take your attention somewhere else, the needle goes right back right. to what it was, yes. and it points again yes. at the anger or at the sadness or mm -hmm. at the happiness or whatever it's pointing at. Oh wow, this I love when you. <laughs> give me those moments on camera. That's awesome. Okay. This is really, really helpful for myself and for when I'm dealing with other people to kind of understand them a little more. Because I've wondered like, why are you getting so mad over some little comment or thing that someone said? Why is this triggering to you? But that's because they've repressed that feeling for so long yeah. and they thought they had control over it. Sure. And it looks like you do until you start getting jaw and neck issues and you like manifest mm -hmm. sickness and illness and hives and breakouts and <laughs> all kinds of yeah, things. Yeah. Like you store emotions in your body, you repress them and shove them down. They are coming back out. They are going to erupt in your skin or some other thing. They're going to erupt onto a fight with somebody else. Yeah. But this doesn't answer your question about why men oh, are yeah, better at I'm controlling sorry. it. Yes, yeah. So your answer to my question was that people are better at X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. because of practice and experience. Right. And so what does that mean about men's practice and experience with emotions versus women's practice and experience with emotions? Well, I, I think after the whole conversation we just had about triggers and repression and all that, I think, and I could be wrong. Maybe they're not good at it. Yeah. I, I think actually maybe it what looks like control may be repression. And though I think men with men, have more control over their emotions in the workplace and stuff around other men. I, like, again, this is a general generalization because there's always going to be an outlier or exceptions and whatever. But for the most part, I think maybe men might have more opportunities to practice this because it's also more socially acceptable for a woman to cry. It's more socially acceptable for a woman to get emotional and to express herself or even if she's triggered and expressing the repressed feelings, it's more acceptable and we have more opportunity, whereas men kind of have no choice but to practice this. Because men are told more often not to cry and don't be a, a baby and, and man up and this kind of thing. And I think I could be wrong again, but 
I, I think this may be why you guys have more practice at this than we do. Okay. But that sounds like practicing repression. Well, that's why I said, I can't be sure if it's control or practice and maybe and it's a theory that because you guys repress so much then you start to learn to practice actual control at some point. <laughs> Maybe I'm just confused. Your question implied that men had more control in general on average of their emotions. Yeah. But now that we've talked, I'm, I can't tell if you still believe that implication that you had in your original question. No, actually, now I'm thinking that men are just better at repressing okay. their emotions than they are have control. Okay, so then it would be fair to say your your new question is why are men better at repressing their emotions? Yeah. And the answer is practice and experience. Yes. And so would the flip side be why are women better at expressing their emotions? Oh, because we have practice and, and experience. experience. Okay. When we met, you were great at expressing your emotions, but you just wouldn't stop. Like you did it so much nonstop and it caused problems and drama. I like, I almost was begging for you to repress some emotions. Like I, I know that's not going to have a positive <sighs> result. Yeah. Okay. So actually I think overexpression and repressing, they both can't lead to good things because for me personally, overexpressing small little everything that bothered me, it, it just started to wear on our relationship where I was crying all the time. And I was in a way using you as a therapist when I shouldn't have been, when I should have been dealing with things internally on my own. Yeah. I want to clarify that when I say repression, I mean, having an unhealthy antagonistic relationship with the emotional compass, with the needle, whatever it's pointing at. Right. Okay. Okay. Because expression and repression are not opposites. I was like, oh, women are better expression. Men are better repression. But this is not exactly the case. It's more like overexpression and underexpression are opposites. Okay. But repression is screwed up either way. Like this repression is terrible <laughs> either way. Okay. This is good. This is good. But overexpression can be a thing. Yeah. And underexpression can be a thing. And mm -hmm. both of those have their, their time. Yeah. So for example, if I feel a ton of rage, I can exercise discipline and like pull it back. Yes. I can count to 10 internally and choose not to express it. This has the effect of leaving me calm and in, in control and not carried away by my emotions. Mm -hmm. They still exist and I haven't repressed them. I know the gauge is there. I know the compass is there, but I'm under expressing. I want to nuke the entire world. Instead, <laughs> I punch a pillow. Right. And this is a positive thing. So yes. when people were listening to us, they might think, oh, repression is good sometimes just like the example I just gave. Yes, yes. But I don't call that repression. To me, that is under expression or disciplining your expression. It's pulling back your emotion. It's a form of emotional control. I agree. Because if I asked you, how are you feeling? And you've held back that, that anger and that rage, but you're in control of it. If you were repressing, you would say, I'm fine. Or I would explode in rage at the tiny little question. Right. But and when it just you're comes in, flooding out but, because I was repressing it. Right. But when you're in control of it, this is when I ask you, hey, what's up? How are you okay? And you're like, well, I've been annoyed. I'm annoyed because I play this game with these fools and they made me mad. This is control. Yeah. But I underexpressed it in the room. Yes. I didn't throw the laptop across the room right. or anything. Mm -hmm. I pulled it back and I disciplined my expression and I underexpressed the truth of that emotion. Right. Because expressing it fully would not be a positive thing at the time. Right. But also, if you were truly repressing it, you would blow me off and, and let me believe there was nothing wrong. Yeah. This is repression. Yeah. Where you deny the emotion and deny the compass and so Right. On. Okay. Great example. But at the same time, under expression can go to an extreme and then you get this cold, emotionless person who never expresses anything yes. and it's this isn't very healthy either. Right. Overexpression can also go to the extreme where you're just constantly expressing and the tiniest little thing becomes a giant drama yes. and you're just hurling your emotions around at everybody yeah. and living in them and dwelling in them. And it's like, could you just stop expressing for a bit? Like yeah. what is, pull it back, pull it back. And so I think it's more fair to say men get more practice and experience with under expression and pulling it back. And that's a good thing, a healthy form of controlling your emotions mm -hmm. or can be. Right. But it can go to extreme, which is not good. Mm -hmm. And women or feminine leaning people get more practice expressing. And that's a good thing too, but it can go to an extreme. 
Right. Like anything, it can be taken to an extreme. Right. But no matter which side you're better at personally, mm-hmm. uh, repression is still the worst. I agree. And it's it's a third thing. It's a separate thing. Okay. That's good. I'm glad you pointed that out. And we, we got here. This is good. Because uh, again, with the language thing, I, I was under the impression they were the same thing. So thank you. It was really good. Wow. I love when you do that. And <laughs> I learned stuff. <laughs> well, so did I. <laughs> I never clarified those terms before. And I was like, oh, this is important. People are going to get confused. Yeah, that's good. So I love you. it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to move on then. Uh, about a year ago, uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock made headline because at the Oscars, Chris Rock made a joke about Jada, Will's wife, who got up and yelled at him and slapped him across the face in front of all of America in the front of the whole world. So he was expressing his emotions. He was not repressing them. He was over expressing them. Why do you think that? And I know this is just your opinion because you don't really know, but why do you think he chose that moment to express his anger over people saying stuff about his wife? So when you or anyone expresses an emotion, it can be done in one of two ways. It can be done consciously and intentionally. Mm-hmm. Or it can be done triggered and autopilot e. Okay. Yeah, I got right? you. Yeah. So if you've ever seen a parent discipline a child in a healthy way, they may have to express some anger mm-hmm. to get the message clear to the child. Right. But if the parent goes to their room, meditates, gets in the zone, thinks it through, writes down some solutions, comes up with, I should ground them, but I think I'm going to have to raise my voice a little to make this clear. Mm -hmm. And then they go and do that. This is a parent who loves their child and wants to do the right thing. And it it hurts me more than it hurts you. And I don't want to do this. And It's really heartbreaking. And But you got to have some consequences. Yeah, they're not triggered and whooping their butt. No, they're not not triggered at all. Uh, They gave it days of deliberation or whatever, Mm -hmm. hours of deliberation. And so they're expressing their displeasure or their guiding hand or whatever it is, the best way that they know how. And it's a very consciously expressed emotion. Right. But you could see the same thing with another parent and they just hurl the chunkla at the child, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. This is a trigger parent. That's, a, that's a, a sandal or something, right? It's a sandal, yes. I love it. On a spaniel. <laughs> it's so cute, yes. So, so yeah, same, same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Both are expressing their emotion or their, their displeasure, Mm -hmm. but one in a very conscious, intentional way, this is what needs to be done. And one in an unconscious autopilot E way. The same thing can happen if a couple is out at a party and, you know, someone approaches the girl or disrespects her Mm -hmm. or something, the man in the couple may defend her honor or stand up for her or something, but he can do it in two different ways. He can do it consciously and intentionally, raise his voice, say a sharp word, hey, excuse me, sir, back off. Mm -hmm. Or he can just like see red, turn rage, have some trauma come up and punch somebody out, like just at the drop of a pin. Right. Both are expressing displeasure or boundaries or boundary setting or something like this. But one of them is expressing in a clearly conscious, intentional way in the moment. You know what? I have to do something here, but I'm going to make sure it's an appropriate expression. Right. The other one is just some crazy triggers from traumatic past relationships or something, anger issues or something. Yeah. So in the Will and Jada case, which form of expression did Will choose? And can we even know? Well, yeah, I think it was super triggery. Who gets mad and freaks out at the Oscars and just slant, like hits somebody? This doesn't seem to be a thought out thing. (laughs) However, however, it might have been. It might have been thought out. It might have been like for attention. It could have been coordinated between the two of them. Chris Rock recently did a Netflix special and I watched it. From what he said, that wasn't a coordinated thing. He was not expecting it. It did hurt. It was much bigger than him. Uh, and it really made him mad. I thought he handled it pretty good. Fair enough. But we still don't really know. Yeah, this is the thing. The conscious expression and the autopilot expression of an emotion can look identical mm-hmm. from the outside. Right. Oh, that man is yelling at that other man mm-hmm. over his girlfriend. I think he's just triggered. But maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was like, this is 
exactly what the situation needs. I'm going to do this and, you know, take the consequences. Right. So then really we can't know only the person doing the the action really knows whether this was a triggered or it was thought out. Yeah. But you can ballpark it. You can spot some indicators and spot some signs. Oh, okay. For example, Will Smith, I believe, has never done anything like this. No. Ever. Public violence has not been part of his agenda. His brand. No. So this is so off brand and so ridiculous okay. that it's a it's a good sign this was not a consciously chosen thing because consciously through his whole life he's been choosing not to do that. Yeah. Like, right? Yeah. He wouldn't even curse when he was rapping. Right. Yeah. But the trouble with spotting signs and taking a ballpark guess is that it's just a guess and we could be wrong. Right. So it's fun to gossip and, oh, I, I wonder why he did it. And I think it's this and I think it's that. But really, all of society could use a little more benefit of the doubt and a little more, I, I don't really know, and a little more, I'm just guessing. Right. Well, cheese is really fun and really nice to talk about. That's why I started when I said, I know we don't know is your opinion. So, so okay. in my opinion, if you want the juicy gossip, Always. It's most likely from career or relationship pressure. Right. So when people accomplish a lot and succeed and are generally fairly good at dealing with the public and being in the public eye and managing their brand, I haven't done studies and I don't have the data, but I bet the most common reason for outbursts and blowups and triggers like this have their roots back to career or relationship pressure because career and relationship pressure are the two most traumatic powder keggy things in people's lives that cause them to behave out of character or away from the norm. Well, we do know that he's gotten a lot of crap about Jada cheating on him in the papers and on social media and stuff. He got a lot of crap about being a, you know, a little P word over it. I mean, I, I don't know if that led to this or whatever. As part of the cheese man, <laughs> is that uh, he, he's in the papers. People said a lot of crap about him not being a man and letting his wife cheat on him. And so maybe that contributed or whatever. Maybe. Or maybe he doesn't read the papers and doesn't even know. Right. That's just what the narrative is for the masses. Right. It could be anything. Right. It could be that he feels like he has to compete with Tupac or the memory of some other man or they've had some issues in their relationship or she thinks he's not man enough or masculine enough or he thinks he's not man enough or masculine enough mm -hmm. and a show of force and defending my girl's honor is going to be the way to do this and so it just triggers and snaps the opportunity happens and it could be anything right. but really what matters most is that more of us, all of us, become good examples of navigating our emotions in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's Will Smith or your best friend, they need a role model. They need to see this. Yeah. And maybe we'll have less slap moments. It's true. Thank you. That's great. I appreciate it. So Will Smith kind of acted triggery, whether he did or not. The action seemed to be a little bit... Uh, because of the place and the time and the situation. But Chris Rock didn't say a word for a year until his stand-up thing. Do you think, and again, it's just opinion because we don't we don't know what's going on inside. Do you think this shows more control over how he felt? I mean, it looks like it, but just like with Will's side, how are you going to know? Yeah. Maybe every fiber mm -hmm. of his being was telling him, speak up, say your piece. Mm -hmm. And he ignored or repressed those emotions <laughs> and waited a year to look good for the public or something or, you know, enough, right. out of guilt or I don't know what. And if he did that, then his classy waiting a year to speak or put it in his special is just a form of repressing the emotions. Fair play. That said, I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. He seemed to handle it with a fair amount of dignity and class. Mm -hmm. And I would guess that he exercised some emotional control and, and held his tongue for a while. Generally, don't feed the drama is a good core principle for emotional control. If you would like to control your emotions, that is a great place to start. Someone pissed you off? Chill. Don't feed the drama. <laughs> right. You saw some juicy gossip on TV? Chill. Don't feed the drama. Somebody slapped you on stage? Chill. Don't feed the drama. This is a very good starting point. Now, it's not always the right path, 
sometimes it's better to engage the drama, but this is extremely rare. And a better rule of thumb is don't feed the drama. And I feel like Chris Rock did that. Okay. That's, now, I got you. Now, a year later, he's kind of stirring the drama up yes, again yes. with the special. Right. But he's putting it to a purpose to serve him and to create good material and to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you feel about artists putting their dramatic experiences into their work, but it's a common thing and he's chosen mm -hmm. to do it now. So either way, he didn't feed the drama for a year. Yeah, so. I, I agree. And I think it's very normal for an artist to write or do what you know. We we do that in our podcast. We talk about our relationship. We talk about our lives, our past. And this is, this is what most artists do. Um, so I, I wasn't surprised to see that he's talking about it in his special because why would you not address that? This is what typically what, what artists do. But, you know, it's always nice to get some of that cheese mess. So <laughs> either, way, either way, I enjoyed it. Uh, and yeah, I thought he handled it pretty classy, actually. So thanks. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> liberals. All right. I want to preface this a little bit before I ask my question. So I spent a lot of time online communicating with people in the right and the left right i'm center leaning right party list and i noticed that a lot of liberals tend to not always but some of them especially the far left tends to use a lot of emotions in their arguments or their their speech their content whatever and they they seem to care more about emotions their feelings over actual data and facts and science so my question to you is, how can we, anybody, talk to somebody who is throwing emotions at you and you're trying to counter with data and statistics and science? How do you deal with someone like that? Well, how do you deal with a spoiled child who won't listen to you or do what you want and just keeps hurling emotions at you? I feel this and I feel that and you're a meanie and you're bad and I don't like you. And there's zero logic. It's not a real discussion. They're not engaging you. They're not even listening to what you say. Mm. They're just throwing stuff and pointing at you and generally being a dramatic, emotional ball of tantrum. Oh, so you mean like my kids? Mm. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, so yeah, they behave like that a lot when right. they were young. And how do you deal with them? My real question is, do you engage with this spoiled, tantruming child in discussion? Or no. do you tell them to go to their room or do you go for a walk? Like, do you engage in conversation with them? No, they're not listening. Right. And so whoever you're dealing with, who's all up in their feelings and is just hurling emotions around and not using facts or data and not arguing a proper point and not having a productive discussion, they're clearly self-centered at the moment and self-absorbed at the moment. And they only care about themselves. They don't even hear what you're saying. They're not going to register it or remember it. It's a giant tantrum for them. It was a giant tantrum when they were a child, and it's a giant tantrum now as they're swept up in their emotions getting triggered. A triggered adult is the same as a triggered child. Nothing has changed magically. Just their they, size. Yeah. They still get swept up in their emotions and tune out and are not reasonable to discuss things with. The only way to handle someone who's doing that is to go away. Yeah. yeah. There is no other way. It's like arguing with a grizzly bear. No, but I have food for you and I'll trade it to you if you don't maul me. Like <laughs> the grizzly bear is swept up in its emotions. Yeah. It's mad you in invaded its space and it's going to maul you. It doesn't matter how much. Look, I will take care of you and all your grizzly bear family in perpetuity. <laughs> Fish, berries, whatever you want to eat. If you just don't maul me, you're you. mauled. There's no point. Right. When people are in attack or defense mode, which is what emotionally triggered people are in, mm -hmm. they're either running from pain or greedily trying to get pleasure. It's a very emotional thing. There's no logic here. There's no discussion here. There's no reason. There's no rationale. Jumping into conversation is a giant waste of everyone's time. It's, it's just going to make you upset. I think there's a phrase, don't try to argue with people on the internet. They'll bring you down to their level and beat you with experience or something. <laughs> or don't try to wrestle a pig. You just both get dirty or something. Right. Yeah, fair enough. And these phrases are not exactly about over-emotional people relying on feelings rather than reason, but they sort of apply. Yeah. Don't do this. Right. And learn to hone your radar. Learn to notice when someone is in an emotionally triggered state and just disengage. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's it's true. So, uh, like recently, I was on a comment section and somebody said they were going back and forth and the the liberal said there were no differences between men and women and i laughed and i was like uh yeah there are of course there's differences between men and women sure but even for them to say that for them to even utter that out loud shows a lack of reason right it shows someone who is completely in their feelings and all they care about is how they feel i i feel there are no differences between men and women they didn't come out and say that but if your radar is good you can spot it right And then to add to it, their next comment, when I said that, their next comment to me was, I'm a teacher in the science industry. And I came back, I was like, I'm so glad I'm not in your classroom. Uh, And and then they demanded, like in huge letters, demanded from me to list the differences between men and women. I said, thank you for your input. Have a nice day. Because if you are in the sciences and you're a teacher, you of all people should know the differences between men and women. And whatever I said in that moment, they were going to have an argument for. Absolutely. And you can tell you're just talking to upset Vanessa or upset Johnny or upset Sammy or whatever, like a a little child who's like, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, well, my mom's better than your mom. So there, (laughs) yeah, it's, this is not an argument or a point. This is not a discussion. This is not a conversation. This is you feeling defensive, being triggered and spewing out whatever bullshit you can to, to be right and win the argument. It's like, you're talking to a tantruming child Yeah, and they don't, they don't know they're a tantruming child. But they are. Of course they are. And it's okay. I don't judge. But it's really helpful if you can hone your radar, spot them when you see them, Mm -hmm. and just move on. Which it sounds like you did. So great job. I did. Thank you. Um, And you you taught me that when somebody is triggered and they're emotional and they're all in their feelings, they block out any logic. They can't hear it. And and I I recognize this firsthand in myself. So I know it's true. We had a discussion a couple of months ago and I said to you, I'm really sorry, but I'm emotional and I'm not hearing what you're saying. And and afterwards we talked about it later, but it felt so good to recognize that I knew what you were saying was probably making sense, but I was literally, it was like I was covering my ears because I could not hear the the data, the logic, the the, the science of what you were saying. Well, and, the reality. and the reality. And I knew that this person who's in the sciences was feeling the same way. I should point out that someone who's feeling emotional or getting caught up in their emotions can actually be brought out of it with logic sometimes. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how strong the emotion has become. Like if you catch them in the early stages saying something like, well, don't worry, everything will work out. Look, I already have this solution planned out and yada, yada, yada. And the data says that so-and-so and and this is unlikely to happen and only 1% chance of ever happening. So sometimes if you can say those things, the logic will, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you've done that to me too. You you've started but, logically and it knocked the the sense into. But it me. only works when you catch it like yeah. on the way up, or right. I don't know, it's reversed on the video. But <laughs> right, you have to. The logic can only work up to a certain point. Once it's hit past a certain mark, it's they'll they won't hear anything until the emotional ride is over. Yeah, and she had like when I clicked on like the replies where you could see there was like a giant list of where with other people that she had like gotten into. So there was no way anything I wrote was going to get through this person or it was going to make sense or reality was going to hit them. So I was just like, I I ignored it. I didn't reply or anything because of this. Good. So did I answer your question? Did you did. Thank you so much. Okay. In our book, eyes wide open volume one, you wrote free will means you can pause see things differently and adjust your emotions. But it also lets you obsess over the compass needle, dwelling in feelings that harm your life. So I spent a hundred million years of my life dwelling in those feelings. Like I had massive depression for years, but on top of it, I never tried to like come out of those feelings. I dwelled and lived in that Oh my God, I'm horrible. Oh my God, I hate my life. I listened to sad music. I watched sad or scary movies when I was like that. I never tried to lift myself up out of that shit at all for years. But you, you taught me how to love myself. You taught me that I had value and that I was amazing. And and this is what we, we do for other people now. 
And by you teaching me this, this is how I was able to pull myself out of that cycle of depression and then some happiness and then depression. It was just like over and over and over again. So you taught me how to love myself so that I can pull myself out of that. I was hoping that you could tell people what you did to help me. So maybe they can help themselves also to not dwell on those feelings of despair and sadness. Sure. How do you change any compass or gauge? The gas gauge is empty. What do you do? Oh, you fill it with gas. Yeah. If you're going south and you want to go north, what do you do? Turn around. Yeah. It's the same with your emotional compass. If you're feeling sad and you want to change, what do you do? You do things to feel happy. Yeah. It's a big, wide world out there. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many different things you could possibly do to change your feelings? Do you think if I told you to make a list of things that change people's moods or feelings, you would run out of items? Oh, no. Yeah. It's no. infinite. Yeah. It's infinite. There are infinite things you can do to feel better. Some take more work than others. Some take more energy or resources than others. Some are smaller. Some are bigger. Mm -hmm. But there is infinite. So there's no excuse to not, right? If you're in the forest and your compass is pointing the wrong direction, there's 360 degrees to turn around. It's true. Yeah. You can turn a little bit. You can turn a lot. Just start. Oh, you're 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 paralyzed. Okay, just lean one direction. <laughs> yeah, you said to me maybe you could try being happy for five minutes tomorrow or five seconds. Yeah, there are infinite things you can do. If you were depressed for 24 hours yesterday, maybe you could try being depressed for 23:59 today. Show me you're a big boy or a big girl and you can actually do something. Show me you have hands and a brain and you can actually be happy for 60 seconds at a time. <laughs> yeah. It's not a big ask. No, no. Pet a cat for 60 seconds and tell me you were miserable. It's purring under your hand. Let a dog lick your face for 60 seconds. Sit in a bath or a shower for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know what? That feels better than the misery in my bed. <laughs> Stretch your body. Do a yoga stretch. I don't know. Listen to a happy song. Watch a happy film. Go for a walk in the sunshine. Go for a walk in the fresh air. Go for a walk around your house. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. If you have a needle or a gauge that's low, there's some very simple ways to start making progress on this. Even if you've let your gauge get incredibly low. Yeah. I get it. It sucks. It sucks ass. But you can change it. It's just a compass. It's just a guide. It's trying to point you the way. It's like, hey, dude, maybe use some of your God-given hands and brain and legs and mouth and eyes, your, your, your thoughts, conversation. Use something that you have to make a slight difference in your mood and the world around you, your environment, whatever you can do. And it might start super small, but like anything that starts super small, you can make it bigger and bigger. Start with one bite of the donut and eventually you finish the donut. Start with one step up the stairs and eventually you make it up all the stairs. Start with one slight change in your happiness and soon you'll be very happy. Like, I don't know, man. People don't like simple answers. They want it to be super complicated. They want depression to be an unbeatable monster and that's their excuse to just never do anything. But it's not, that's not how it is. That's not how humanity is. Depression has existed since caveman times. People have been killing themselves since caveman times. And the way to solve it has always been the same. Use the great wide world of options and opportunities and free will that we have out there to stop obsessing over the needle and how bad it is and start changing it, start moving it. But it takes a little effort. It takes a little focus. And that doesn't come from anyone outside. It comes from you. It comes from you personally. So if anyone wants to change their needle, they're going to have to start with their own personal effort and focus. No way around it. It's true. And what, what you said uh, is really good, how people want things to, to be complicated. So when I was in my depression, I for those who don't know, I spent 24 years in therapy, taking medication. I was miserable, depressed, diagnosed with bipolar, panic, anxiety disorder. And I quit medication in 2006, I think and been medication free since then I still had issues and when we met all of it went away because of this this right here and at first I was like wait I I have con control no nah. and it sounds really dumb and so easy and like duh but my therapist never told me that <laughs> my I spent years with my therapist who told me 
that I could not, I would never get better, that I was going to have to spend my life in therapy and it would be a journey forever. No, that is not the case. And, uh, and it didn't happen overnight. And I started by changing my media. Okay, I'm done watching dramas. I'm done watching the news. And I'm done listening to sad music. Those three things made such a huge, huge impact in my life that I knew that if I kept going, that I would start to feel better. I quit the painkillers. I quit crying every day. I mean, I should clarify the crying every day before was because I hated my life and life sucked. Then it turned into crying every day because I was emotional uh, because I had been repressing stuff for so long that everything was coming out about everything. But this was different. It was way different than crying because I was miserable and depressed and I hate my husband and I want a divorce and I'm living here at all. No, these steps, it sounds simple because it is. And if if a woman with bipolar disorder and six panic attacks a day could heal herself with this thing, this simple thing you taught, anyone can. I'm not special or magic and I've done it. And now I don't suffer from any of that stuff. I mean, I get sad occasionally, but mostly because I'm not doing this. So thank you. Yeah. I also told you to spend more time in your bathroom or Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Out of my environment. environment. Yeah. 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 And it worked. It yeah. Worked. Or a library. Like Starbucks will let you spend spend forever there for like two seventy five or something. I went get the small smallest coffee there and you can just stay there and chill. All day long. I got to know all the baristas. I made friends with the manager. Uh, I even got to the point where I would buy my coffee there and go get food from elsewhere and bring it there. They all knew me. They all loved me. Um and I you know, I tipped as well as I could. It moved the needle though. It did. It really, really All these did. things move the needle. Um, and Anyone it, can do them. Yeah. It was close to home and my kids could come. Uh, my kid would come after school and see me and we would hang out at Starbucks. And it just made, and it made my relationship with my son better too. Because I wasn't crying all the time. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for teaching me this. And thank you for teaching them this. Um, and I just want to add one more thing before we move on to the next question. If you're struggling with depression and anxiety and you want to talk more about this, the steps and, and like maybe more of what I did, I'm more than happy to help. I always put my email address in the description. So please feel free to reach out. Plus there's the mental health article, 59 things to do to fix your mental health. Yeah. Oh, I'll put that in the description. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, it was mostly for like money, anxiety and OnlyFans people, but it's, it's universal. Actually, every single thing in that article too, I also used to improve my life. And even though it's marketed towards money and, and the, when we were working with OnlyFans girls, all of it makes perfect sense and it's really good. And, and each one of those tips could be a book on its own. So, yeah. so a lot of people tend to make decisions based on emotions. I did. I made knee-jerk decisions based on emotions, and then regretted it later. So why is making decisions solely based off of emotions a bad thing? Because your compass or your gauge is a tool to help you. It should never be making decisions for you. Would you ever let your compass make decisions for you? (laughs) Let's say you're in the forest camping Mm -hmm. and you're going south and you're like, oh crap, the compass says we're going south. I wanted to go north. This is not good. It's time to make a change. I have to make a decision. Right. Now, if you turn around, there's a giant cliff in front of you. So do you just listen to the compass, turn around, go north? <laughs> Walk right off the cliff? No. Yeah. No. It's a shitty decision. Right. What if you turn around and there's a frozen lake that may or may not be safe? You just, well, decision made. Time to go north. <laughs> not the best idea. Right. Maybe your decision would be better to test the ice. Maybe you test a little and walk a little and test a little and walk a little. Or maybe your decision is, oh, well, there's a cliff. We don't have rock climbing gear. I guess we're going to have to go west for a while. Life has all these situations presented to us and the emotion will point that something needs addressed, something needs changed. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to make some decisions or take some actions here. Uh, Adjust your approach or perspective, get a bigger view, look up some data, do some research. Uh, start tracking evidence, uh, have a heart-to-heart with somebody. You're going to have to do something. Your emotions are telling you. 
Right. You, you're going south. You need to turn north eventually somehow. But it should not be making the decision of what you do next. All right. And when people make a decision based on their emotion, they're letting the emotion make the decision. All right. Fair enough. Your, your soul should be making the decision. Your consciousness, your intention, how you want to live your life, your free will should be making the decision. Not some knee-jerk emotion, not some anger or some guide. Like my other examples about the, the guy at the party who someone's hitting on his girl mm -hmm. or the parent disciplining the child. One way of making the decision is to let your compass, let your emotional compass make the decision for you. Oh, this is what it says. I'm angry. Time to throw the chunkla. Like this is not why your emotional compass has ever been given to you. This is not why we have this in us. It's a helpful tool, but it should never be making the decisions. Instead, put some deliberate conscious attention on the emotion, get to the root of the feeling and figure out what's a healthy way to proceed, a mature, healthy, thriving way to proceed, and then make that decision. Okay. Your compass is one tool. Your consciousness is another. This one shows you what needs your attention and what needs change. This one helps you make the decision of what's a healthy way to proceed. Mm -hmm. Please use both at the right time for the right purpose. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for all your answers and the perspective shift that you helped me with. And I love when you do this. You're amazing. You've changed my life in so many, so many ways. This was a big thing for me, learning how to handle my emotions, not letting them control my life, making decisions, um, for the right reasons that things that felt right to me, things I, I wanted, not because of what I should do or what in the triggered moment I should do. Uh, and I've done this. I've, I've almost ruined our relationship several times because I've tried to make a decision based on those, on the knee jerk reaction, the triggered feeling. And I didn't think it through. And then when I did, I regretted it and it did not feel good. So Thank you so much for all of that, for helping me change my life, for writing the book so that we could help other people start to change their life. Thank it's so good. It is. It really is. Uh, this. Uh, that's why I read that part from the book today because that's in the book and, and, and it was so helpful for me. Everything in there is what I use to change my life. And I'm forever grateful to you because I never will go back to that sad, depressed person who uses her emotion as weapon. Uh, I will never be that person who throws and flings my emotions everywhere at everyone. And I am practicing it, having more and more control over them. So thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. Um, okay, so do you have any final thoughts that you wanna share with our audience? Yes. Our audience is awesome. You guys are amazing and you're powerful. Okay. And powerful people make good use of the tools that they've been given. Powerful people never let the tools run them. You have been given logic and reason. You have a logical thinking brain. You use it to make sense of stuff and you have emotional feelings and both logic and emotions are your tools. Your emotions are meant to guide you and point you towards things that need attention. They need your focus. They need your applied effort of some kind. And your reason, your thinking, your brain is meant to help you decide what to do about it in a healthy, mature way to think things through. And our society today is all up in their feelings. They're, it's an emotional society. Everyone's triggered by politics and triggered by the media and triggered by their friends and triggered by their enemies and triggered by internet trolls and triggered, 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 triggered. There's almost zero thought going on. They just see red nonstop or they're sad nonstop or they're celebrating and partying nonstop. And it's like, you were never meant to live this way. Just ignoring one of your most precious tools and over relying and identifying with the other one. And so I want to see your power shine. I want to see it blossom. I want to see it grow. I want to see you create the life that you want to create. And I know you can, and I know you will. And I know you're on that path and you're going to do it more and faster and better if you stop letting these tools control you and instead start controlling and practicing and mastering the tools, especially your emotional compass. I love you all and I hope this helps. 
And that's why our book and this podcast is called Eyes Wide Open. Keep rising.